Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, we're really pleased to have with us from Microsoft, Harold Wong, who is one of the lead cloud architects working with Red Hat on making OpenShift work wonderfully on Azure. And he's going to be um, regaling us with stories of how to do that and talk through using what they call quick start templates. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Harold um, introduce himself and his topic. If you have questions, ask them in the chat. Um, we're going to let him run through most of his presentation, hopefully without interruption, and then we'll ask, we'll open it up for Q&A afterwards. So go for it, Harold. Thank you. Uh, yes, so real quick, are you able to see my slide as I present it right now? I can see one that says OpenShift on Azure. Okay, perfect. So yes, my name is Harold Wong and I am with Microsoft. I am what's called a cloud architect or sometimes my title could also be technical evangelist. Uh, ultimately, what I do is I work with uh, partners to make sure that their products or to help them get their products working in Microsoft Azure correctly or to put things into the marketplace. Red Hat is one of my big uh, partners that I cover, so there's a lot going on and I've spent a lot of time working on OpenShift over the last year, uh, making sure it runs correctly and installs correctly in as automated a fashion as possible in Azure. So is that a good enough intro, Diane? That's perfect. That's a great way to start. Okay, so then I guess it'll just make sense for me to keep on going. And I have a few slides so that I can talk through a few things first, and then I will spend the majority of the time uh, demoing and, and walking through what it actually takes to install uh, OpenShift on Azure. So if you look at OpenShift, OpenShift has a lot of infrastructure components that are required, right? You need a VM, you need networking components. And so I just wanted to put simply up on a slide, what are some of the core Azure components that will need to be deployed, right? So you're gonna need to deploy your VM so that you can deploy your master nodes and your infrastructure nodes and your application nodes and so forth. So that might be three, it might be 30, it might be you know 100 VMs, all depending on the size of the cluster you wanna deploy. With those VMs, you're gonna need to deploy you know network interface cards and so forth as well. Uh, from a networking perspective, you'll need a virtual network. I know I'm going out of order. And on that virtual network, it's essentially a private virtual network in Azure where you create subnets and then you put the VMs on those subnets. Right? Within that for uh, access from the internet and whatnot, you'll probably need load balancers. So we do have Azure load balancers. And with these load balancers, you will create a probe that will check for the health of a connection. Then you'll create load balancing rules using those probes. So if I've got one public IP associated with a load balancer, that's gonna load balance uh, three master nodes behind it, I would create a load balancing rule for the console access, right? Port 8443, if I'm gonna do cockpit port 9090 and whatever else you might need. You can create NAT rules so that you can allow incoming uh, traffic such as SSH. If you want to expose SSH directly to the master nodes, then you would create a NAT rule that says, I want port 2200 to point to port 22 on master node one, and so forth. You also need network security groups, which allow you to lock down traffic and say, I only allow certain types of traffic to this set of VMs or this set of uh, this particular subnet. So network security groups allow you to control what type of network traffic is allowed in as well as out from your VMs. Right. A public IP is just a, an entity that allows you to specify whether you want public IP access to a given VM or to a load balancer or whatnot. Right. So you don't have to assign public IPs to every individual VM. Uh, probably don't want to do it, and I'll show you I don't actually do that. We only do to the load balancer so that you have access to the load balancers for master access or access to the router, which is sitting on the infrastructure node. And then you do need storage. So all of these VMs have uh, OS disks and data disks that are associated with them. And you need to have storage accounts to store all those uh, disks for. I also use Azure storage or for the, sorry, for the Docker registry. Uh, that we deploy the private registry. I do use Azure Storage. So 
uh, I provision Azure storage for that as well. And then we link it so that you have persistent storage for your registry, All right? So these are just some core components. So I wanted to make sure you understood you still need all of that infrastructure stuff. However, you deploy it manually or automatically, it needs to be deployed. And then this is just a quick diagram showing you what I generally deploy using my templates for Azure, right? I've got a master subnet where I throw in my master nodes, I throw in my infrastructure nodes. I also have one VM that acts as the internal load balancer running HA proxy for internal communication with the master nodes. And then I have uh, application nodes that deploy to a node subnet. And you can see I've got two load balancers that I deploy, the ports that are exposed, there's a public IP on in front of each one of those. And then the, the NAT rules or the ports that are open so that you can gain access as appropriate. And then in terms of installing OpenShift, I don't think I need to explain how to install OpenShift. I just put this down so that I can make it clear that installing OpenShift in Azure is really no different than installing OpenShift in your on-prem data center, in AWS, in Google Cloud. It doesn't really matter, right? If you can set up infrastructure somewhere, you can install OpenShift in the exact same manner. So you would install your RHEL instance, you'd install all the necessary tools, create your config files, and then you run the OpenShift Ansible playbook. And however long it takes for that to run, you know, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, depending on how many cluster nodes you deploy, it probably takes a little bit longer, then you have your OpenShift uh, cluster up and running, All right? So in the Azure world, you could do things manually, right? I can go in and from the GUI or from the command line, I can go deploy a VM or deploy 30 VMs. And then I can set up all the networking manually. I can set up everything manually, right? And then go run the install of OpenShift. Or you can create what's called ARM templates where you define the stuff that you want to deploy. You create all the necessary scripts and in the ARM templates you say, go run these scripts and then you answer a few questions and you tell Azure, take this uh, script file or this ARM template file and the parameter answer file that I created and go do your thing. And I walk away and I come back later and it's all done. Right? And that's fully automated. There's a few pre-steps I have to do, but for the most part, it's an automated install. And so what I actually want to do in the rest of this time is walk through beginning to end what it would take to use an existing ARM template. I'm not asking you to go create one. I'm not gonna show you how to create one, but I will show you the templates that I've created, the scripts that are used. And if you want to deploy OpenShift origin, the very first link will take you to a, what's called the Azure Quick Start template that deploys OpenShift. I am gonna say right now, that is not 100% working and it's only deploying Origin 1.3. I have not updated that one. Uh, that's in my to-do list. I've been spending more of my time getting OpenShift Container Platform working correctly and, and fully functional and whatnot. So that is in my own repo. And that's the one I'm gonna pretty much walk through. So let me go ahead and break out of the slides. Let me bring up my browser here. And in this very first one, if you, hopefully you can see my screen. Well, I've give got, a second, you're still looking at your um, slides, so. Oh, really? Um, there we go. Okay, I guess it's just a little bit uh, delay, but hopefully everybody can see my, my Chrome. Mm -hmm. And this one is the Azure Quick Start template. You can see I, uh, only something was updated 14 days ago because I had to correct an error in a script. Uh, this one takes a little bit longer because I don't control this repo and uh, every time I make a change to it, I have to go fight somebody internally to say, please merge my change in. And so either way, uh, this one I'm hoping to have fully updated in the next week, week and a half to be deploying uh, OpenShift Origin 1.4 with all the core components that I deploy using a container platform. So I'll switch over to this one and you can see I've got almost the same concept. There's a, a readme. And if you do go look at this, please do take the time to read the instructions fully. 
And what I'm going to do right now is walk through what you need to do from the pre-work and then what you need to do from the answer file and how to deploy that. And I'll actually start a deployment going. But the key thing is there is this file called Azure deploy.json and there is a Azure deploy dot parameters dot json which is the parameter or the input file for the azure deploy dot json so i've got uh, notepad plus plus on my machine and let me just open up the azure deploy dot json file so i can show you it, it's quite a lengthy file based on all the stuff that i deploy but i want to at least walk through some quick basics on this first right in here, you'll see there's a parameter section where I design, define all the parameters that I accept, including VM size. I can even say, you know, which ones are the allowed sizes, uh, define this size, admin username. So I ask for a bunch of different inputs, and then I define a bunch of variables that I end up using, things that I don't need input for, but, you know, I build, there are things that are, are needed, like the name of the host. So I create a bash and host, there's a master host, nodes, the infra host, the load balancer host. And so I create names based on some of the parameter inputs that I've asked for. So I define a bunch of different variables that, that I end up using. Let me scroll down over here. And then the key thing is I define all the resources that are going to be created. Uh, here you can see there's a network security group that's created and based on the name, this is for the bastion host. Right, where I allow only port 22 to connect to it, right, so that I can SSH into it and do troubleshooting and make sure that the install worked correctly. I create an NSG for the load balancer host, and there's an NSG for the master host, the uh, infra host, and so forth. Right, so I define all of the different resources. Don't worry about understanding all the resources right now. Just know that I define them. There's uh, documentation that you can read to really understand what all of these resources are. But I, so I create a virtual network. I create uh, all the different storage accounts. I create a public IP address, right? Whether it's a static or a dynamic, and I create two that three, uh, two that are static, one that's dynamic. I create these availability sets, right? And then one of the things I wanted to show when I create my virtual machine. I know it's very convoluted and complex looking, but it doesn't matter what order I create or I define my resources. Azure will try to deploy them all in parallel unless you tell it, hey, this resource depends on this resource existing first. So when you create a virtual machine, before the virtual machine can be created, you do need to have the NIC created that's going to be associated with that VM and the storage account so that the OS disks and whatnot can be created. So I define all the resources in any way, shape, or order I want, and I just define the dependencies so that if this resource depends on two other or three other resources, it waits for those resources to be completed before it moves on. And so deploying all the, the infrastructure resources, straightforward, once you understand how to use this template. And once again, I'm not asking you to create it, I've created this one for you so that you can just use it. And then after the infrastructure stood up, I run scripts. So I literally have a couple of scripts and let me go ahead and open up the script file here. So that you can just see an example, my deploy open shift. So I have a script that essentially sets all the necessary files I need. It creates uh, the different YAML files I'm going to use for the different playbooks I'm going to run. It creates my host file as I need. And I know this is a little hard to read, but you can see there are different pieces that are being done. But this is just your, your regular host file that you would create for installing OpenShift. Uh, you may not use all of the same parameters I use here, but I do build this so that then the Ansible playbook knows what to do. All right, so enough of that. Uh, let me jump back over to the parameters file. So this one here is just a parameters file that explains or kind of has, here's where you fill in all the inputs, right? The VM, the master VM size or the node VM size and the instance count. And I put things in that says like change me, 
right? These are the things you need to change or set the different values for. So what I did in my little demo one is I pre-filled a bunch of stuff in, right? Like my, the VM size I wanna use, the public DNS name I wanna use. And by the way, these need to be unique. So be very careful what you put in there uh, in terms of their, their DNS names that get published in DNS. Uh, this one, since it's container platform, I am asking for the uh, cloud access username and password and a pool ID so that you can I can authenticate to your Red Hat uh, subscription and then uh, subscribe or register all of the instances and attach to the pool that has OpenShift and do all the install. Right? We put in the public key. Uh, I'll explain this resource group thing for Key Vault. Uh, actually, I'll explain it now. That's so that we can pass in the private key in a secure manner. And then if you have a zip.io or if you're going to use a, a custom domain, like for me, I might use apps.weocd.net and I'd put that in over here. And then this one would be changed to custom. All right. So let me go over to my uh, shell. If you look at my, what is that? If you look at the repo and read through the readme, the readme does say you do need to generate your SSH key pair. So let me just go do that real quick, right? I'm going to walk through this. So in my directory here, I've got all these little uh, JSON files that I'm going to use. Uh, so I'll do the SSH key gen. I'll just do ID RSA. Very important thing is you cannot use a passphrase. So it will be insecure. But after the deployment, you can go back and you know replace the, the key pairs with a more secure one. So I'll just do this. You can see I've got my ID underscore RSA, my ID underscore RSA.pub. So those are my keys. And if I keep reading through, it says, hey, here's how you would go ahead and create the key vault. Right? And I provide PowerShell steps as well as Azure CLI steps. So you do need to install the Azure CLI. If you haven't already done that, I'll give you a link uh, to, to do that. But let me go ahead and do the Azure login. That does require me to do aka.ms device login. I need to put in this code because of the dual factor authentication mechanism. And then I authenticate here, go back to, to this piece, and hopefully it will uh, authenticate shortly. And there we go. So now I'm authenticated into my Azure subscription from the CLI. And I am just going to go ahead and uh, follow these steps, essentially, that say, here's how you create the key vault to store the key. It's not that difficult. It does require some typing. So I'm going to do Azure group create and if you really want to learn more you can look up documentation on the azure cli commands but these are the basic ones for creating a resource group so i'm going to do azure group create uh, let's see rg demo west us and you know what let me just make sure i don't already have that I need to make sure because sometimes i run through the demos and i use the same thing so i'll create it in the west us data center Enter here. I guess I should go back to this so you can see the the commands I'm typing. The next one is Azure Key Vault Create Dash U. Uh, let's see. I'll call mine Demo Key Vault Dash G for the demo group or the resource group, which was RG Demo, and Dash L for location. And I'll do US West. Uh oh, that's not good. Oh, it is already in use. So let's. Well, that works. Demo key vault one. Because that also has to be unique. So we'll create a. That's already in use too. Okay. <laughs> HW demo key vault one. How's that? See if that works. Otherwise, it's going to be Diane's key vault number one. 
there we go. So we have HW Demo Key Vault 1. <laughs> live demo, right? This is all live. So let's see, Azure Key Vault. I need to create the secret now. So I'll set the thing based on the HW Demo Key Vault 1. The secret name, I'll call it Key 1. And then I use a file. So in this case, it'll be dot uh, ID underscore RSA. So I'm going to read in the private key and inject it into that secret. And now I need to do Azure Key Vault set policy. I need to allow this key vault to be used for uh, template deployments. So I'm going to do set policy dash U HW demo key vault one, and then enabled for template deployment true. And I'll just show you the actual key. So let's do an Azure key, key vault secret show, HW demo key vault one. One. And you can see this is the actual key or the secret, and that's essentially my private key. Right. And actually, if we go in now and refresh my browser, you can see my RG demo here. And in there, I've got my HW demo key vault one. And in this key vault, I've got a secret called key one. And if I actually click on it, we can even show the secret in the in the GUI, right? So you can see that it is holding my my private key appropriately. So that's the very first step. So the next step is, and I'm not going to do this. I already have one that's created, but we would go in and edit the Azure deploy parameters file with all the appropriate things like my SSH public key. I would put in my, you know, this thing would be what HW demo key vault and so forth, right? So I'm not going to do that here. Uh, instead, I will just go ahead and go back to my shell. It's clear. And I'm going to go ahead and initiate a new deployment uh, and deploy that entire infrastructure, right? So I'm going to do uh, Azure group create. Uh, let's create a new group. I'll I like to put zeros in front so it comes up to the top. What should I call it? Dan, give me a give me a name so that I can name this resource group. Um, OpenShift two or OpenShift one, something very bland. OpenShift one, very bland. And I'll do this in West US. Okay, so now that I've created the resource group, I'm going to do my deployment. So I'm going to do an Azure group deployment, create uh, name for the deployment. I'll call it OpenShift 3.4 uh, resource group is equal to, I don't mistype it. Split file is Azure deploy.json. And then the answer file is Azure deploy.parameters.hw.json. I, I created that one. I'm not going to show it because it has my passwords, and I am not going to show that. Uh, and then I'll do a no wait so that the, the command prompt comes back immediately. If I typed everything properly, you can see, hey, now it started or it created a deployment. And if I go back to my GUI, it's just easier to show on a demo like this. You can see the resource group, the five zeros dash, dash OpenShift one. If I come over here, you can see that resources are now starting to be deployed, right? All of these network security groups, there's a public IP over here, this thing called availability sets, my virtual network. If I sit here and refresh, you'll see a bunch of other things slowly pop up. If I look here, you'll see it says deployments, and there's one thing deploying right now. 
if I click over to here, you'll see the deployment name. I called it OpenShift 3.4. And if I click on it, you'll see the status of everything. And over here, you'll see that there are inputs. So these are all the inputs that I put in. Anything that is a security thing, like a password, I don't display. Right? So that's hidden. And then you can see the status of what's going on. Anything green means those are already completed. So you can see these are storage accounts that were created successfully. It's creating now the VMs. So if I refresh, hopefully, and this will take a little bit of time. So I'm not gonna sit here during the whole course of this and, and wait for it to complete. Instead, you know how it goes with demos, I've got something in the oven. So last night I deployed to a resource group called uh, OCP34-G, and you can see similar things. There's a you know bastion node, public IP. There's a bunch of network security groups. Uh, I've got my deployments, and that it says succeeded. You can see this one has. This is the one I was showing you in the other one where I called it OpenShift 3.4. Same concept, you'll see all the input parameters that were supplied. You'll see all the things here are green, but one thing after it completes that you'll see here, and when the one I just started completes, I'll have it there as well, is I output some key things so that you know how to connect to this instance. So the console URL is this uh, HW master DNS G000 dot West US and so forth, right? Port 8443 console. So if I copy that and let's go log in. Oh, HW admin and password. By default, or as part of the script, uh, I do automatically make this first user a cluster admin. So I see all of the, the key projects. I can go into default. Uh, why it can't get the metrics right now. But you can see that I've got the registry deployed. There's the router deployed. And if I come in and look at the Docker registry and look at the environment variables, what I did as part of the automated deployment is I automatically use uh, Azure storage. So you can see I set the environment variable for registry storage to be Azure. And then there's a account name and an account key so that we can access it. And then I created a folder called registry in there. So if I actually go show this to you real quick in this, I need to find the storage group. this one here and if you're not familiar with the azure portal it i know i might be walking a little bit fast but this is not the time to actually go and give you a full you know tutorial of the the portal but either way you can maneuver around in here as well as from the command line it's just easier to show in a in a demo a nice little gui so you can see that this storage account had a registry container or folder created and in there, there's nothing right now. So let me just go ahead and do a quick deployment. Right? I'll just create a new project. We'll call it uh, OpenShift Commons. We'll deploy a quick cake PHP plus MySQL example. And this will take just uh, a few minutes to complete, I hope. And what I wanted to show is once it starts going is uh, we should be able to see the fact that the registry actually is being used over here. So we'll let that run. Uh, I'll come back. Let me just open another portal here real quick so I can bounce back and forth between the two screens. It's Let's just check on the status of this deployment, see how it's doing. All right, so you can see that my VMs were created. Uh, it's actually now deploying uh, or running scripts to prep all the nodes and so forth. So things are coming along good. Uh, why don't I take some time right now?
while we wait for this quick uh, kick my PHP example to deploy and answer some questions. So um, there haven't been any questions. So people, if you're in the participants list here, if you'd like to ask questions, just chat, throw it into the chat or I'll unmute you and you can ask directly. Um, you said something interesting to me. Can you do most of this um, deployment process through the Azure UI as opposed to at the CLI level? Oh um, yeah, absolutely. So let me, in fact, let me show you uh, in my little GitHub repo, after you read through the instructions, there's this thing that says deploy to Azure. If I click on that, it'll literally take me to my Azure portal, take the contents of that template file and inject it into a what's called a template deployment. And now from the GUI, yeah. I put in the same, you know, I enter the name of the resource group I want to create. And the nice thing here is anything where I put a like a list of things that you can select from, you just literally select from the list. Yeah. So here I would do HW master DNS, HW infra DNS, something. For the master count, I can choose one or three. For the node instance count, I can choose one through 30. So I'll do 15, right? For the disk size, I give you three options. I'll choose the 128. There it is. All right, so I can definitely just answer these questions here mm -hmm. and hit uh, deploy. So over here, I would say, I agree, and then hit purchase. Does it pop up for the credit card number? No. No. So this one, uh, we assume that you already have an Azure subscription and you're being billed somehow. Yeah. At this at this point, I think you've got you've got my information by now. Um, that's interesting. So this is all running off the set of scripts, the JSON file that's in your GitHub repo right now. Correct. All right. So, right, and there there are pointers that go back to it. So if I'm looking at my GitHub, let me just bring this back up. In this Azure deploy.json file, which if I come over here, you'll see there's this artifacts location. Mm -hmm. It points to my GitHub uh, repo under master, which is essentially here. So whenever a script runs, it literally pulls it from this scripts directory. Now that that seems not that we don't love seeing your name on everything. That seems a little um, temporary that it's sitting in your directory there. Um, is there any plan on making these um, move into a semi-official? Yes, there are. In, uh, so I do have plans to put this into the Azure Quick Start. So remember where I was showing you the one for for the origin one, so that's in AKA. This one is quote unquote, the official stuff, right? The ones that Microsoft, somebody at Microsoft has officially blessed and said it does work, mm -hmm. right? Not that we necessarily support it, but it does work. Yeah. And so this one, I do plan to put my OpenShift container platform templates into the quick start templates as well as updating the OpenShift origin one that I created. This is the one I created as well. Okay. It's just that in order, so with all the changes I've been making on my container platform one, it's very hard to get uh, pull requests approved in a timely fashion by this group. Sounds because, so familiar, really. Yeah, it does. I've never so, heard of that before. So the way I do things with that, uh, key vault, which is a requirement that the quick start template team put on me anyways to put anything into the quick start template. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to use this key vault. And because of the key vault usage, the automated testing fails every single time because oh. it does it can't generate that key vault automatically for the test. So it will fail. And then I have to go, you know, ping the person that pr approves it, explain every single time why it's going to fail no matter what I do and they should just approve the merge. And that usually takes a month. <laughs> and so that's why right now, all of this stuff I'm doing in my repo. And so I'm not the only, I mean, there is a gentleman from Red Hat, right? Uh, Mangus has 
uh, been contributing as well. Okay. So it's it's not just me. No, there's I know there's some people in the OpenShift Online team that are taking. Oh, Angus Magnus. Too, so. Yeah, and and I'm hoping uh, Thomas uh, Thomas Weiss said he was going to take a look and hopefully make some uh, some recommendations as well and do some PRs. And mm -hmm. I I pronounced Magnus's name incorrectly, so I apologize. That's funny. <laughs> So let's see if, if you've finished spinning up OpenShift. Well, this, it, oh, it failed. So I must have done right. something wrong. Oh, you know what I did? My DNS name, I forgot to change it. So it was already in use. Ah. But it would not complete just because this normally takes, if I'm, especially with 15 uh, agent nodes, it'll probably take about 35 to 45 minutes to complete. So it doesn't happen in 10 minutes. There is a, a bug right now in the, the playbook when we install the metrics where it goes through multiple retries before it completes or is successful. So that just adds more time to the deployment. So is that in the Ansible playbook that the issue is? Yes, and that, that uh, tidbit of information is from uh, Magnus. Uh, he, he even updated the it's in the script he put that in. Awesome. The, yeah, he did put into the script file that there is a bug that causes it to retry. Where does he specify that? Right here. He does say it'll, it may deploy and tr retry 59 times before it completes on the 60th. So that just adds time because there's a wait period between each retry. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. So let's at least go see if my registry. Oh, there. So remember, I deployed that uh, take my PHP app. Mm -hmm. See in the Azure storage account, there is the cake PHP my example. I just wanted to show that the layers are pulled in and it is stored in in the storage account. So if I come back over here, I should be able to pull up that application. Oh, awesome. You are now officially an OpenShift evangelist. <laughs> well, this is, it's, it's a little more complicated than I thought it was going to be, but I think once you get the scripts, the JSON stuff figured out and you're used to working with that, it's not, um, it's, it's, it should be pretty smooth. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, so if if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is uh, harold.wong at microsoft.com. And if you have any feedback you would like to include into this particular repo before it gets into the uh, quick start templates, please let me know as well, because I can make those changes way easier now versus uh, in a month. Yeah, so what we'll probably do is I'll, I'll post this on our OpenShift blog and we'll see um, what we get for feedback on it. Um, it really is, as, as Steve is saying, very nice to see this running on Azure. And um, thank you very much for all the work that you've obviously done making it um, work so smoothly. So um, we'll hopefully get a few more folks going on this. I know we have one um, group of folks down in Brazil, the, the GetUp Cloud folks are running on Azure quite ha happily and hosting a public pause there. So um, we, we know this is uh, the one of the more viable options for running this OpenShift at scale. So hopefully we'll get some more feedback and a few more people working on this with you, and um, we'll get some more um, feedback at the Azure at the OpenShift Commons gathering um, in Berlin in a couple of weeks too as well. So thank you very much for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, we're we're getting a lot of uh, customer interest on even on the Microsoft customer side that. Uh, wants to deploy OpenShift in Azure. So I've been pinged by a lot of people to, to make sure my, my template works correctly. Yes. Well, um, now they know who you are, Harold, so watch out. Um, <laughs> you get a lot of feedback pretty fast. So thank you again for, for taking the time to do this. And um, this video should be posted. If you can send me um, a couple of links to, from the different repos, that would be great. And we'll get it all up there and get you some more feedback. And hopefully a few all more right. commenting and giving you some issues as well. Perfect. Thank you so much.